the average patient that we see at doctor's hospital is seen probably six times. He's seen the patient once, maybe twice, and getting results there are, that are in many ways superior to ours. Um, I think it's very interesting. I think many of the things that he is, that he's pointing out and that he's treating are problems for which we don't have any other uh, solution or any better solution or certainly any harmless solution that doesn't involve some sort of intervention with drugs or surgery or right. something. Um, it certainly seems to me to do no harm to the children. Oh, I'm, I'm a changed person, physically and mentally and probably spiritually to boot. I, he, that man has completely turned my life around. He saved my life. I'm convinced he saved my life. Most people associate successful medicine with the kind of practice and teaching that go on in institutions like this, the University of Arizona Health Sciences Center. Modern scientific medicine, known as allopathic medicine, often succeeds in treating victims of trauma and acute bacterial infections. In addition, its techniques are good at managing many medical and surgical emergencies. Allopathic methods have been much less effective in dealing with chronic degenerative illness, viral infections, allergies and autoimmune diseases, cancer, and mental illness. There are alternatives to allopathic treatment and care, many of them quite successful. This building houses the office of Robert Fulford, doctor of osteopathy. Dr. Fulford practices what many consider to be a unique form of medicine, unusual even within the osteopathic profession. And that first breath, if it's taken completely and properly, should expand that... Completely. In 1978, at the age of 74, Fulford moved to Tucson to retire. Since then, he's been unable to stop practicing due to his popularity among patients and high demand for his services. Dr. Fulford was born in Cincinnati in 1905 and was graduated from the Kansas City College of Osteopathic Medicine in 1941. The following year, he opened a general medical practice in Cincinnati where he remained until he came to Arizona. In many ways, Fulford resembles the founder of osteopathy, Andrew Taylor Still, a renegade physician who settled in Kirksville, Missouri in 1874 and there founded a drugless system of treatment based on manipulation of bones. Like Still, but unlike most contemporary osteopaths, Fulford gives no drugs, uses no diagnostic tests, and relies on manipulation alone to treat a variety of medical problems. Fulford's work is also based on the theories of a 20th century osteopath, William Sutherland, who developed his ideas over 30 years and announced them to the profession in 1939. Sutherland introduced the technique of cranial manipulation, and described an aspect of central nervous system physiology he called the primary respiratory mechanism. Fulford's ideas and methods place him in the Sutherland tradition. He is one of the foremost teachers of cranial osteopathy, and much of his diagnostic and therapeutic F focuses on the primary respiratory mechanism. I spoke with Dr. Ford about this concept. You talk a lot about the primary respiratory mechanism. What, what is that mechanism? <coughs> Well, the primary respiratory mechanism was um, named by a man by the name of Dr. Sutherland. He was a DO? <clears throat> he was a DO. He spent uh, 20 years working out the process and then to spend another 10 years before he, of trying to disprove that he ha ha was on the wrong track. And then he finally uh, came to the conclusion that it was time to announce it to the profession. What he found out was that there is 26 movable bones in the skull, that the membranes over the brain, such as the dura mater, has motion, that the, <clears throat> the brain has a definite uh, rhythmic motion, that the spinal cord and the covering over the spinal cord has a definite rhythmic motion with the brain and that there is a respiratory motion within the sacrum and it's this respiratory activity that goes on uh, 
forcing the cerebral spinal fluid back and forth over the brain cells and down through the spinal cord and the nervous system that is more necessary than what he classifies as secondary respiration, uh, such as we see through the uh, lungs and so forth. And its importance and health? It's, to me, it is the most vital thing to the welfare of the human being. These notions are obviously foreign to the allopathic medical school curriculum. Few MDs would consider the idea of an intrinsic rhythm of the brain and the cord, and even fewer would see its relevant health and illness. Yet Dr. Fulford maintains that 95% of all people have some restriction of the primary respiratory mechanism, and that when severe, these restrictions are the root causes of much chronic and recurrent illness. The primary respiratory mechanism is defined as a series of intrinsic expansions and contractions throughout the central nervous system, coincident with heartbeat and respiratory pressure changes. According to contemporary osteopathic theorists, it has five components. One, intrinsic motion of the brain and spinal cord. Two, fluctuations of the cerebrospinal fluid. Three, mobility of the intracranial and intraspinal membranes. 4. Motion at the sutures joining the cranial bones, and 5. Involuntary motions of the sacrum. He believes restrictions in the primary respiratory mechanism arise two ways. As a result of failure to take a first breath at birth, thereby not expanding the cranium fully, or as a result of trauma in early life, both physical trauma, like falls or blows to the head, and severe emotional traumas. I asked Dr. Fulford to give examples of diseases that can come from disturbances of the primary respiratory mechanism. A lot of eye disturbances, a lot of uh, hearing problems begin to show up. Uh, we find out a lot of the emotional problems which people begin to complain around about 27, 32 years of age is another thing that comes into the picture. Learning disabilities. Learning also. disabilities go start in way back around three three years of age. I think a lot of the arthritic activities that we are confronted with in older age is basically the failure of the of the normal respiratory activity or the normal motion of the fascia throughout the entire body to keep the fluids in motion. Uh, uh, is a very good example. Fulford's practice consists mainly of pediatric patients. The most common pediatric complaint is recurrent ear infection or otitis media. Well, we're back again to the drainage of the lymphatic system which drains into the bloodstream at about the level of the third cervical, ver uh, uh, third uh, thoracic vertebra. <clears throat> Now, if we are not getting good respiratory motion throughout the rib cage, then the drain lines are blocked, and the drainage from down out of the neck, the lymphatic drainage through the neck area, is not having a chance, and so it backs up and sets up an environment for your infectious disease. Stagnation. It's a stagnation problem. So if that's not corrected, the antibiotics just kill the bacteria that are there but uh, suppress the symptoms mm -hmm. and six weeks later they've got another case of otitis media mm -hmm. other conditions that may result from restrictions in the primary respiratory mechanism include gastrointestinal disorders and a variety of metabolic and endocrine disorders now when you examine a patient uh, are you looking for that how that respiratory mechanism is operating and, and how do you determine that? First, through observation, I first observe whether the rib cage is in motion or whether most of the breathing is going on in the abdomen. The second thing that I do is put my hands on there to see how much excursion that the diaphragm is creating in the rib cage. And then we go up and observe the contour of the skull, whether we have a flattened area on one side and a rounded area on the other side, and then by putting our hands upon the skull, we 
watch to pick up what's known as the cranial rhythmic impulses in there, which is determining the motions of the two hemispheres of the brain. When you determine that there is a restriction in uh, the primary respiratory mechanism, what can you do about it? How do you treat it? <clears throat> well, the, the first thing that we try to do is to see to reestablish the motion in the in the cranium. Uh, then the next procedure would be to. And, and how do you do that? Is that cranial manipulation? That's through cranial manipulation. So it's direct hands-on. On the cranium. Technique. Yeah. Uh, then the next procedure would be to try to to get the sacrum loosened up to get it into motion to take the tension off of the spinal cord. And how do you work on the sacrum and other parts of the spine? Well, the sacrum can be, there's a regular cranial uh, technique to release that, which can be released with the hands. But I myself uh, use a mechanical procedure to release Could it. Could you describe that? And the mechanical procedure is uh, known as a percussion uh, vibrator. Uh, it uh, actually, uh, the same thing can be done with a hand percussion uh, instrument that we use to check the knee reflexes and so forth. But that's a little hard on the, on the wrist to do it by hand. So we have the electrical mo motor that drives this percussion and we most generally have the percussion going at about 250, 55 strokes per minute and put it on there and finally, the resistance of the tissues cannot uh, <clears throat> resist the high vibratory rate that's going on, and they'll finally release themselves, and then it's easy to manipulate the bony structure back into its normal pattern. Allopathic doctors generally regard the sutures of the skull as locked and immovable. Many osteopaths share this view. They consider cranial manipulation both heretical and fantastic. But studies at Michigan State University's College of Osteopathic Medicine have confirmed Sutherland's theories of cranial motion and support Fulford's techniques. We followed Fulford's treatment of Alexander Lawry, an identical twin who presented with a number of problems. Dr. Stafford, you've been a twin's pediatrician. Could you tell us something mm -hmm. about Alexander's medical history and mm -hmm. the problems that he's had? Okay, both twins were adopted. Um, they were premature when they were born, and they got into respiratory distress. They were born in a peripheral part of Arizona, and they were flown into Tucson for the management, and they were hospitalized for about five or six weeks with um, respiratory distress, fairly typical of a, um, of a premature infant. And then subsequently, um, they were neglected and they were admitted when they were about a month of age. They returned home to their uh, family home and then they were admitted when they were about a month of age with profound what's called failure to thrive. In other words, they, they hadn't gained hardly any weight since they had been discharged. And so they remained in hospital for another two to three weeks recovering from that. Um, and, and this was true for both of them. Um, since that time, Alexander has had, um, they were adopted uh, by the current parents when they were nine months of age. And at the time that they were adopted, Alexander had uh, already had, I think, three ear infections. And then subsequent to that, in the last, um, um, they're now 20 months of age. So uh, in, in that period of time, he has had four more ear infections. How have you treated the ear infections? Uh, with conventional antibiotics. And do you know of anything that serves as a prophylactic treatment for recurrent otitis media? Yeah, there are a couple of, um, for children who are getting frequent ear infections, uh, one standard um, medical therapy is to give a low dose of an antibiotic such as gantrosin, a sulfur drug, uh, over a period of several months, usually about half of what would be the accepted treatment dose. Mm -hmm. And there's a surgical treatment? If the eustachian tube gets uh, persistently blocked up, then another option to maintain equal pressure in the middle ear with the outside so the ear drum can function is to place a tube, uh, actually create an artificial hole in the eardrum. And that is highly successful uh, as far as a treatment. But it does mean surgery, it does mean an operation. Dr. Fulford treated Alex for his recurrent otitis media, concentrating on the sacrum and the cranium. 
At the same time, he also worked on Alex's hips to correct a congenital problem of bowing of the legs. I spoke with Alex's mother 10 days after the treatment. Um, now, he was about to have some teeth come in yes. at, when he was treated. Right. And one of the concerns was that he might get another ear infection. Right. What, what happened? He has three canines through the surface of his gums now, and the other one, actually the other one may be through today. And, um, what, three days ago? No, today's Wednesday. Five days ago, on Saturday, he started producing a lot of mucus and was congested. And I thought, oh, no, you know, he's going to get an ear infection. But he just was very mucusy for two days when he got the, the one canine through the flesh, actually. And um, he didn't get an ear infection. And that's a change from that's the, the previous first pattern. Time. Every upper tooth has produced an ear infection. Mm -hmm. this, this is the first one that hasn't. I also spoke with Anita Stafford, 10 days following treatment. Mm -hmm. You've had a chance to examine Alexander shortly after he treated him. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what you found? Um, I, yes, I examined um, Alexander's ears both before and after he was treated, and he, he hasn't had a further bout of ear infection since then. He has been through the eruption of another set of molars, which in Alex has been usually associated with another ear infection, and uh, his ears have remained perfectly okay. Um, it's probably too early to say at this particular point whether the treatment for recurrent otitis is really effective. He hasn't had any infections since the treatment, but that's only a short space of time. I think time will tell as far as that's concerned. At two months post-treatment, we visited Alex at home to see how he was doing. How's Alexander been since we treated him? Oh, he's been so much better. He hasn't had an ear infection. Um, it's been two months and a little over a week, and that's the longest time in his life he's gone without an ear infection. He hasn't had to, have to have any antibiotics, which is also the longest time in his life he's gone without antibiotics. Um, I've also really noticed that his upper respiratory congestion uh, is almost gone. Um, much, much better. I talked to Dr. Stafford again at six months post-treatment and asked for her evaluation of Alex's progress. Dr. Stafford, it's been six months since Alex was treated by Dr. Fulford. Have you mm -hmm. had a chance to examine him recently? Yes, I have. And what did you find? Um, he's had no evident. He's had no episodes of otitis since that time. Is that significant uh, at this state? I would think that it is. He has had uh, frequently his episodes of otitis seem to be associated around the time of tooth eruption, and he's had two or three teeth erupting since then. Um, but no episodes of otitis, and I had examined him several times just to be sure of that. We followed Fulford's treatment in a number of cases. He proved to have a remarkable success rate. Conditions treated successfully included ulcerative colitis, learning disabilities, childhood asthma, sleep disorders, and various musculoskeletal problems. What can we learn from Dr. Fulford's apparent success? At the very least, it demonstrates that more than one way exists to treat disease. Fulford's alternative treatment is much more cost-effective than most allopathic medicine, since it requires no technological hardware and often no more than one or two visits. Moreover, it cannot harm. Fulford, then, is an excellent observer of the famous admonition of Hippocrates, primum non nocere, first do no harm, a principle, unfortunately, no longer stressed in the training of physicians. If you had a say in designing uh, medical school curriculums, both for MDs and DOs, what, what changes would you like to see or what, what uh, kinds of subjects would you like to see emphasized? Uh, basically, I'd, I'd prefer to see them emphasizing functioning over symptoms. You have a symptom, but what in the functioning side of this human body caused that symptom? And if once they could understand that function 
is so important to the welfare of this human body. Why Fulford is so successful is not clear. At least some of his success may depend on patients' belief in his treatments and methods. Most don't care why his treatments work. They are simply grateful for improved health with no risk of side effects and at little cost. They're also grateful for the chance to interact with this unusual, effective, and inspiring physician. I find it refreshing to see an effective and successful system of treatment that uses no fancy diagnostic equipment and no drugs while revering the healing power of nature.